Howdy, my name is Nonat, and welcome to another installment of the Pathfinder Spellbook. In today's episode, we're taking a step back from level 1 spells and jumping into a very unique type of spell, Bloodline Spells. These are spells that are only obtained by sorcerers and only by playing a sorcerer of that specific bloodline. They range from really cool to kinda lame, and I'm excited to talk about them, and we're gonna do things a little bit different in this episode. Usually I rate them 1 out of 5 stars as we're going, but instead of rating them with stars, I'm going to rank them. There's only 10 of these in the core rulebook, so we're going to be going from my least favorite in 10th place all the way up to my favorite Bloodline spell and the, to review last in 1st place. So we're going to go ahead and get right into this, and I'm excited for this new format. Also, if my eyes seem to be popping a little more, it's because I was messing around with something that required makeup earlier, and I tried to wash it off, but we don't have any makeup wipes, so soap and water does not get mascara off very well, so I just have a little bit of a gh left. Anyway, let's get going. Hold up. Before we get started, I want to bring some attention to an adorable Etsy shop known as Arcane Spectacles. They're currently selling dice trays for different classes and systems. These trays have a neat little spot for keeping your regular dice, and then have these nifty little systems for keeping track of your spell slots and other class features. Like this sneak attack tray, where you can keep all your d6s, and it even shows you the level you get to add another d6. Now, while most of these trays are currently for D&D 5th edition, they have just released the Pathfinder 2E Spell Slot Tracker. This tray works for any spellcasting class in 2nd edition, and it keeps track of your spell slots, your focus points, and even what level you're casting your cantrips at, because I personally always forget and have to do the math. The only thing that would make this better is if it were free! Alright, you got me. We're giving away one for free! If you follow the link in the description to Twitter, you'll be taken to a specific tweet. To enter into the giveaway, all you have to do is retweet that tweet while also tagging someone you think would enjoy this dice tray. You know, like that forgetful sorcerer who can't remember how many focus points they have left. Conveniently. After that, just make sure you're following both myself and Arcane Spectacles on Twitter. I'll leave links to both of our accounts in the description. On Friday morning, I'll be picking a winner from all the names that satisfy these requirements, and they'll get this beautiful 2E spell slot dice tray completely free. So if you're interested in this beautiful spell slot tracker from Arcane Spectacles, go to Twitter, enter the giveaway. You have nothing to lose. Alright, enough of that. Let's get on with the video. Starting off in 10th place, my personal least favorite, Undeath's Blessing. This is for the undead bloodline of Sorcerer, and it's honestly really lame. To me. If you guys- I'm gonna need your help here, let me explain it first. You touch a living creature and it makes a will saving throw, unless it's an ally, in which case they don't need to make a saving throw, they can just let it happen. Then, for the duration, your harm spell treats the target as if it were undead, and the heal spell treats them as if they were living. So both spells heal the target, and if you heal them with the harm spell, they regain two additional hit points. I don't... I don't understand. What is the point of this? Why not just use the heal spell? The only time I can see this being useful is for a cleric with the harm font. Because clerics get either a healing font or a harmful font, and they get an extra spell slot for that spell in particular. But this isn't for clerics, this is for sorcerers! So why would they- I guess this way they don't need to take the heal spell? If they need to heal you, with, they could just use the harm spell, but they also have the harm spell for combat, so it's kind of like having both. But this is a range of touch, so you need to be able to touch them, and I don't understand. Every two levels, the additional healing from healing them with harm is increased by two. This also means you can touch- no, you can't even touch an undead target. I don't understand this spell. Please, please in the comments, tell me how this spell can be useful. I need to know. Tenth place. Now, ninth place may surprise some people, because honestly, it's a really powerful spell. Ancestral Memories, for the Imperial Bloodline, is one of the strongest initial Bloodline spells, but I don't like it because it doesn't make sense. The idea is there. You draw from your Imperial Blood, you become trained in any non-lore skill. Why? 
You can also become trained in any lore skill related to your empire. So if your empire was full of merchants, uh, you could become trained in merchant lore. But why the non-lore skills? Why not specific set of skills depending on your empire? It doesn't make sense to be like, Oh, I can't move this boulder! <gasps> Ancestral memories, athletics! Now I can move this bull- I don't get this spell. It's a powerful spell, and if you cast it at 11th level or higher, you become an expert in any skill for one minute. This is really, really good. I'm not covering them in this video, but it's made even better by the Bloodline Magic effect, which occurs anytime you cast a Bloodline spell. For Imperials, that gives a plus one to skill checks for one round. So on top of becoming trained in something, you're also getting plus one for the skill check. And the fact that you're using this out of combat means you can pretty much focus right away afterwards and get the focus point back. I just don't think it makes sense. For mental skills, I personally... I think it should only be usable on skills that require recalling knowledge. I don't understand how you can use ancestral memories and become better at balancing or better at lifting something. All the physical ones, I don't get, and that's why I'm ranking it so low. Personally, the flavor of this spell is just not there for me, and flavor to me is just as important as gameplay. Number 8 had a lot of promise and could have been a really cool focus spell if it weren't so situational. Coming in at 8th place is Angelic Halo for the Angelic Sorcerer Bloodline. All it does is anybody who gets affected by the heal spell while within 15 feet of you gains 2 additional hit points. It sounds really good, and outside of combat, this is really good. To top your team off, you just Ancestral Halo, now I'm going to heal everybody, and especially if everyone crowds around and you 3 action burst, everybody gets a plus 2 to hit points gained. That's pretty good. But in the middle of combat, 15 feet is not very far. Especially as a sorcerer, you're typically going to be hanging back. You can argue that there are melee sorcerer builds, and there absolutely are. But typically, if you're going to be a melee sorcerer, you're going to be picking a different bloodline that we'll talk about a little farther on. It's cool that it doesn't even have to be your heal spell. If somebody's standing next to you and the cleric uh, casts heal on them, they also get the plus two hit points from your angelic halo. It's really neat. And I feel like this focus spell, once again, like Undeath's Blessing, would be more useful on a cleric. Because if you played a War Priest uh, Doctrine cleric, and you're already in the thick of it, and then right as you're running in, you activate Angelic Halo, then perfect. Anytime one of your allies is getting injured, you can just use the one action touch, and that would heal for, you know, 1d8 plus 2. That's really good for first level. But the fact that is, most of the time when you're healing you're going to be using the 20-foot ping, which heals the additional 8 for 1d8 plus 8, and you're usually going to be 30 feet away. Even if you're using the burst, that's still a 30-foot burst, so your emanation from Angelic Halo only covers half of that. So they still have to be standing pretty much right next to you to get the extra healing. I'm just not quite sure about this one. It reminds me a lot of that Divine spell I covered, uh, where you buff someone and their healing goes up. Uh, I can't remember the name of it because it's been so many weeks since then, but it just kind of has that same too weak of an effect and too situational. I like it more than the last two, but definitely 8th place. 7th place for the Fey Bloodline Sorcerer is Fairy Dust. Now this is a decent spell. Honestly, almost all of these, except for Undeath's Blessing, are good spells. That's why it's actually pretty hard to rank them, but I'll get to my issues with this one. So for 1 to 3 actions, you can cover a 5 foot, 10 foot, or 15 foot burst of area with Fairy Dust. All enemies within make a will saving throw, and if they fail, they take a penalty to perception and will saves for one round. My problem here is I don't like the game mechanic of make a will save to take a penalty to will saves. Like, it's cool, I guess, but if you're wanting to nerf something's will save, because it's so high, you I wish it was a reflex or a fortitude save, which obviously probably wouldn't be a spell, at least not of this type. Or even if it could be a reflex save, I don't know, to get away from the burst or to cover your mouth or something, I just don't like that they make a will save to avoid a penalty to will saves. It almost seems redundant. The perception penalties are fine. Uh, another issue I have is that the crit fail is still better than the normal fail, but, like, the fail gives a minus two to perception and will saves for one round. The crit fail only gives a minus one. It lasts for a minute, and it's understandable. A minus two to both for a full minute would be kind of overpowered. 
but I feel like a minus two for two rounds might be better than a minus one for a minute. That's just me. This has a lot of weird stuff going for it. Like, nerfing something's will saves, especially if its will saves are already weak, great, really useful. But it's still a strange ability, and something just doesn't sit right with me. It also upgrades at the 7th, 13th, and 19th level. And each time the initial burst gets 5 feet bigger. So, you know, if you're at 19th level, you can cast this on a 30-foot burst. Cool, I guess? 6th place, for sheer blandness alone, is Elemental Toss. Elemental Toss is just missed potential. It's kind of lazy and boring. It deals 1d8 damage according to your element. Cool, right? I can deal water damage or lightning damage. No. You either deal fire damage, if you picked fire elemental, or you deal bludgeoning. They flavor it as a chunk of rock, a burst of water, or a strong buffet of wind. But those three are all considered bludgeoning damage. And that to me is so boring. Why not make air electric damage and make water? I don't even know if there is water damage. But like, you know, just in case you fight like a fire elemental. Because right now, the way it's written, if you used elemental toss as a water elemental sorcerer on a fire elemental, doesn't matter. It's bludgeoning damage. It's not water damage. It's not... It's... And it's just a normal spell attack. You do double damage if you crit. And I would like to compare this to Produce Flame. Now, if you pick an Elemental Bloodline, you are taking the Primal Spell List. Because remember that Sorcerer's Spell Lists are based off their Bloodline. Which means you can take Produce Flame. And Produce Flame, you might say, oh, it only does 1d4, whereas this one does 1d8. But keep in mind, Produce Flame applies your Spellcasting Modifier. And it's a cantrip, and it can inflict persistent fire damage on a crit. Elemental Toss is 1d8 flat. You don't get to add Spellcasting Modifier. You don't get to add anything. They just take 1d8. So let's compare these two. When heightened at third level, both Cantrips and Focus Spells are automatically heightened to half your level, rounded up. So that would be a second level spell for both of them. Now they both scale with level. So at third level, Elemental Toss is doing 2d8 plus 2 because of the blood, ma- uh, blood match- Bloodline magic I went over earlier. And Produce Flame is doing 2d4 plus 4, plus another 2d4 persistent, if you (laughs) crit. So if we go average middle of the road, let's say that you roll two 4s plus 2 for uh, Elemental Toss, 1d8 plus 1d8 plus 2 from Bloodline Magic, that's 10 damage. If you roll two 2s on 2d4s, that's 8 damage. Now, you might think, okay, that's a higher, you're going to get a higher average with Elemental Toss. Well, here's the issue. Elemental Toss is a focus spell. You get to do that once per combat. Produce Flame is a cantrip you can do whenever you want, as many times as you want. And, ugh, the persistent damage is so much better. The only thing Elemental Toss has going for it is that it is a single action versus Produce Flame being a two-action activity. So... I don't know. I hate the spell. I've talked about it way too much. It's just so boring. I only put it this high up the list because its damage is okay, but it still barely beats out a cantrip of the same level. I should have put this one lower, honestly, especially only a 30-foot range. It's it's a no-go. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know what? I don't care. I'm breaking the rules. I'm demoting this to 8th place. Fairy Dust, Angelic Halo, y'all just got bumped up. Diabolic Bloodline Sorcerers come in in 5th place with Diabolic Edict. This one could have been 1st place. It really could have if it weren't for one thing. One action? Awesome. Duration 1 round? Fine. Range 30 feet? Great. Target? One willing living creature. If this could target anything, give it a will save. It would be really cool. Even if it didn't get a, have a will save, I don't think this would be overpowered. You give them an order, effectively. You know, kill him, run away, fight me. And if they follow the order, they gain a plus one to attack and all skill checks on anything used to accomplish that order. So if you tell them to attack a goblin who's through um, on the other side of an enemy, and they have to tumble through someone to get to that goblin, they get a plus one bonus to their tumble through check. It's really cool. 
And then if they decide, no, 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 I'm done here. I'm walking the other way. And they have to tumble through someone to go the other way. They would take a minus one to getting away from them. Now, this is really, really cool, but it's only useful on your allies because, like it says, you can't even target a non-willing creature, which is where this loses so many points for me. If I could target a goblin and say, run away, and if they didn't, then they take a minus one. You know, no big deal. I spent a focus point. That would effectively be spending a focus point to give them minus one for one round. I think that's fair. And then if they did run away, they would receive benefits, you know? It's this, it would be a really cool way to roleplay around trying to turn people on each other if, you know, tensions are really high and you cast Diabolic Edict and say, kill him. Then he starts the fight with an advantage against his former ally. It's really cool. All of these options, I love them. I just hate the target. That's why it's fifth place. It's got potential. I like it a lot. It's just not quite there. All right, top four. Now we're getting to the good stuff. And coming in at fourth place is Glutton's Jaw for Demonic Bloodline Sorcerers. This is the coolest thing. I'm just going to scare all of you. Jump scare in three, two, one. Mama! Look at this. This is the picture from the core rulebook of Glutton's Jaw. Holy crap. They're... It is so freaking cool. For one action, you can transform your jaw into this horrible monstrosity of fangs and it lasts for one minute you gain a jaw attack that deals 1d8 plus strength and then oh my god when you hit you it to represent like stealing life force you get 1d6 temporary hit points that don't wear off by the way these temp hit points do not have a duration so if you hit and you gain six temporary hit points well good for you until you take a hit or combat ends you have six temporary hit points it's important to know you cannot stack these so you can't make multiple attacks you can only have temporary hit points from one source at a time what this does mean is if you hit and gain one temporary hit point and then you hit again you can opt to re-roll effectively and replace that one with your new roll and you don't have to do that it's optional so if you roll a six you don't have to take the temporary hit points it's so cool the only problem is that the damage kind of falls off that 1d8 jaws attack does not scale with level but every four levels, the uh, the temporary hit points goes up by 1d6. So, you know, at fifth level, you gain 2d6 temporary hit points. And you can see where I'm getting into some more of the uh, the melee sorcerer uh, bloodlines. It's purely coincidence that some of those, most of those are at the top. I just think they're really, really cool. Because imagine a melee sorcerer build who takes this at early levels and can open fights with that to give themselves a hit point buffer. It's a really, really cool build. Top three, and honestly, this next one and Glutton's Jaws could easily be switched because they're kind of similar, but we're going with Dragon Claws for Draconic Sorcerers. Now, this one is cool. Uh, for one one action, basically the same way you do Glutton's Jaws, uh, for one minute, you grow Dragon Claws out of your hands and you gain a claw attack. Now, this claw attack deals 1d4 plus 1d6 elemental damage plus whatever, you know, your strength, and... Depending on the type of dra depending on the type of dragon you picked at character creation, let's say a fire a red dragon, for example, uh, you would deal one d four slashing and one d six fire damage. Or if you picked green dragon, you would deal one d four slashing and one d six poison damage. It's really really cool. On top of that, as long as your claws are out, you gain five resistance against that damage type. So if you're a fire dragon, uh, fire draconic sorcerer and you're fighting fire enemies, grow your claws. Even if you don't use them to attack, you gain five damage resistance against fire damage. It's really good. You can see how this is comparable to the Glutton's Jaws um, temporary hit points, uh, which are effective against everything, and I was really close. I really think that these are pretty much tied. I just gave it to Dragon Claws because the resistance doesn't require you to hit anything, but Glutton's Jaws also can be used against everything, not just the damage type of your dragon. The biggest downside for Dragon Claws is how slowly it scales. It, the 1d6 bonus damage does not upgrade to 2d6 until 9th level, and at that point you have so many better options. It's great because the resistance goes up as well, so you'll probably still want to use it when fighting enemies of that type, but you're going to have so many more spells, and even your cantrips are going to be doing so much more damage at that point. Excuse me.
but 2d6 at level 9 and 3d6 at level 17, it's pitiful. It's not worth using. Uh, but again, the damage resistance is nice. Top two, there's only two left. Last chance to get your vote in that I never prompted, but if you want to vote in the comments or just tell me your favorite, feel free. Second place goes to Tentacular Limbs. This spell is so cool. For one action, your arms grow to 10 feet long, and so everything you do has a 10-foot reach, except for weapon attacks, which is interesting. So touch spells and unarmed strikes now have a 10-foot reach. And whenever you cast a spell, you can spend an extra action to extend that spell by another 10 feet. So that chill touch cantrip with, for one extra action it now has a 20 foot reach thanks to this. And this lasts a minute, which I say it once every video, one minute is pretty much an entire encounter. On top of that, every three levels when it gets heightened, uh, when you use the additional action to extend a spell reach, uh, it goes up by another 10 feet. So if you're level five and you use the additional action, your touch spell now has a 30 foot reach. Level nine, 40 foot reach. Sadly, this does not apply to unarmed strikes, so you can't overextend your strikes, but it would still be cool to see a monk build that uses this and just monkey D Luffy, I don't know anime, I just know he stretches uh, and just bops people from 10 feet away, which is really good because that'll make them waste an action moving five feet towards you to attack. That's actually a huge benefit. And I want to see someone play a sorcerer with a monk archetype who makes use of tentacular limbs so bad. And just like that, we come down to the last one. If you know them well enough, you know which one this is, but it might surprise you that I put this in first place because coming in as my personal favorite bloodline spell... Jealous Hex for the Hag Bloodline. I'll be honest, when I made this list, I did not expect to put this in first place. But this one has the greatest effect, the most versatile effect, as well as stays relevant the entire game. You pick a target. That target makes a will save. If they fail, they become afflicted by a condition that nerfs their strongest stat. So if you're fighting an ogre with 20 strength and they crit fail their will save, they'll become enfeebled minus two. If you're fighting an assassin with 22 dexterity and they crit fail their will save, they'll become clumsy two, taking a penalty to all their dex saves. If you're fighting any kind of spellcaster, wisdom, charisma, intelligence, and they fail their will save, they're taking a minus one from stupefied, which amazing. And this is most effective on spellcasters, because at the start of each of your turns, they do- your turn, remember, not their turn, but your turn, they get an additional will save to get rid of this, which is unfortunate, but especially if you cast this on a spellcaster, and they crit fail and become stupefied too, that also gives them minus two against all future saving throws to try to get rid of this. It's so good. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You done? No? Okay. <laughs> The only weak point is that even on a crit fail, a f one will save will end the entire effect, but it's just so good. The fact that they could repeatedly fail and it could last up to a minute just completely hampers them. It's, it's just so good. The only way it could be better is if they had to spend an action to get rid of it, but that would be way too strong. One focus point to potentially give them a minus one to attack rolls and damage for an entire encounter that's huge. And did I mention it's one action? Easy. No contest. Jealous Hex, in my opinion, is my favorite and best bloodline spell in the Pathfinder 2e core rulebook. And that's going to wrap up this episode of the Pathfinder Spellbook. Thank you for putting up with my weird eyeliner eyes. I know they're distracting. I know I'm gorgeous. But I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you saw, consider subscribing and ring the bell to know exactly when the next video goes live. Check out the description. We got links to the Patreon. We got links to the Twitter. We got links to our Discord, which is always growing. We're already up to like 60 people, 70 people, I think. You guys are amazing, and it's super active every day. I love it. I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. Oh, before I forget, I want to give a shout out to Troy Hughes, Quinn Thulu, Paul Rand, Trevor, aka The Conqueror, and the rest of my wonderful patrons. Why am I so excited? I don't know. It's nine o'clock at night, but I'm going to have a fun time editing this and you guys are going to have a wonderful rest of your day. And until next time, no nat ones.